Peter, how's it going? Hey, hey, how are you, Chris? Doing good. Uh, it looks like you're still at L Smith. Yeah, I just finished making cheese, and I'm uh, going to set up in my empty tasting room. <laughs> looks so awesome. Sad. So sad. <laughs> it's crazy. On it's it's yeah. it's fun because uh, it's a, it's a weird type of play because I stopped by to pick up some ESB and a uh, nice 2014 Old Ale, and you can just you can look at that tasting room and you can be like all the oh. memories in there. Just right. just some really great memories in that tasting room. So big. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Well, on the positive side, the bathrooms have never been cleaner. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> And there's multiple bathrooms now, not just one. So, and they're inside the building. God, you worked there a long time ago. <laughs> uh, what were you up to today? Making a uh, wash drying semi soft cheese. So, uh, nice. yeah, still making cheese every week, and uh, that's been going well. We got the drive up service, you know, and people have been buying the cheese with the beer, so we got that still going. But. Um, and yeah. I also just saw that you uh, posted about the Willoughby collaboration. Do you want to quickly expand right. on that before we jump in? Yeah, we've got a few wheels left. So, um, you know, last week they used pure beer on the rind of a Jasper Hill uh, washed rind cheese called Willoughby, the magnificent, our forge berry this year, our raspberry tart ale. And yeah. uh, because the Liquid City event was called off, um, I thought I'd help them out. So I bought like 10 cases of it. We've been selling it here in the tasting room. And uh, there you go. Uh, Almost 30 pounds already in just a half pound at a time. So, uh, yeah, and it inspired me to try to make my own something similar. So I, was, was, I got creative. I couldn't find a weight. It calls for very light pressing, and my lowest weight is five pounds. But mm -hmm. I, I had a four-pack of the Mick Keller beer uh, Zonk that I brewed with them. Yeah, I, I saw that. Two cans in a, in a holder weighs two pounds, three ounces. So... My cheeses have two little things of beer holding on. My, my two worlds collided. It's, it's, that's like the homebrewing type of mentality, you know, where, okay, we don't have a pump, so we're going to somehow like jerry-rig this thing and then siphon it out and cool it down this way. Like, that's homebrewing to its to yeah. essence. You got that right. And so, I haven't had a haircut since January, and I had a hairnet on all day, so you're getting the hat version. It's not a bad hat, honestly. You guys uh, quick, uh, did some rebranding. It looks awesome. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, and talking about kind of like that homebrew mentality, uh, you've won, you've participated in a couple of homebrew competitions. And if I'm not mistaken, one of your most highly acclaimed homebrew was an old ale, correct? Yep. Um, that style has always intrigued me. So uh, as a home brewer, I spent a lot of time and money trying to nail down a, a nice old ale. And um, in 2005, we ended up brewing it commercially. So 10 years prior, I invented it. And then um, we started brewing it at Gale Smith every fifth year. And then we went every year with it after, I think, 2013, something like that. Yep. But um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's, it, it's not as easy to make an old ale and distinguish it from a barley wine as you might think you know um many old ales i tried at home brew contests they're they're they would have scored higher as barley wines so there are some there, there's some finesse to, to to call it an old ale and to lay it down for 20 years yeah and i think like when it comes to and we'll get into um different styles and how we like to judge them and how uh, the proper way to judging them but sometimes with like especially home brewers we get heavy handed with the hops. We want to leave that lasting impression. And for some of these styles, hops are a little bit more restrained and you let that complex uh, malt bill shine, which becomes right. like, oh, I really just want to hit them with a little bit more East Kent Golding or, or Fuggles, but totally. Yeah, I've always kind of thought the malt character is a little harder to nail than the, than the hop character. And to get the complex melanoidins, to get them all working, I think it's, a, it's an art. and, and not every brewer can can do that um yeah so i appreciate everyone tuning into your show today because they had to put their ipas to the side and we're gonna talk multi beers <laughs> i know it's it's a it's a definitely a change up even though we're in san diego that sun is hitting and it just kind of craves for a really nice west coast low low malt profile big hop character nice and dry but honestly it's always a pleasure to be revisiting 
ESB, uh, revisiting Oldale. What, uh, what are you enjoying right now today? I also poured an ESB. They, they were filling crawlers with it. So uh, probably the first pint that's gone down in the tasting room in two months. But, uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Simple. So much subtle nuances. There's this really awesome, like, estuary fruity character coming off of it. A little bit like caramel toast. The body isn't heavy. It's nice and dry. Makes it drinkable. What, for you, when it comes to English spirits, what's... Because you've made wee heavies. You've made old ales every five years, and then it was every 13, 14, 15, then it became private stock. What's your biggest impression of the English spirits as a whole family? What's the biggest impression of it? Well, I mean, I just think it's fascinating. They really um, single-handedly, the British um, kind of had elevated ales to the common drinker. And, the, you know, 98% of the world drinks lagers, but England held on and they made these fantastic beers. And I think my eyes were open when I traveled and I lived in England in the late 70s and the early 80s, before you were born, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just slightly. Yeah. Um, the real ales were just unbelievable. You go into these pubs and some of these beers were only, you know, 4% by volume and they're pulling them on beer engines and flowers, bitter and all these Samuel Smith and unbelievable beers. And so I would just get into them and, you know, it's hard to put your finger on it. You know, the fruity esters are a big quality and um, the uh, yeast strains. So, you know, diacetyl is, is, is kind of a no, no, but, in most English yeast strains, diacetyl is like right there under the level below most people's perception. And it, it's kind of an important bodybuilder. But, um, you know, and then the noble hops and the unique, those yeast strains just give this what I call, for lack of a better thing, it's just English character. You get yeah. a touch of, you get a depth of complexity that you just can't get with any other beer. And if you, if you, you know, nail your malt bill and you got a nice balance of, hops just to balance and you have the right yeast strain you know you really can make something magnificent so um kudos to the english for a family of beers that are unlike anyone else and we find ourselves all just fighting for second place i think it's 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 truly remarkable because um you think of how far they've gone as well with let's say if they're making a beer it's mainly just brown malt not fermentable and this is before the the indirect kiln where everything had a smoke character to it and then you have the invention of the pale mold basically revolutionizing everything where your grist can be a different ratio pale touch of brown maybe a touch of dark uh, or um, specialty malt but then on top of that uh, how the hops then came to play so it was a slow moving and but they've definitely stayed true to to what they've been making for thousands of years yeah and every little shire every little town has <laughs> on things um all peculiar you know that beer fascinated me drinking um it's made by Thiessen, and um it used to come in a little squat <laughs> wide mouth and it, it's te technically an old ale but it's only seven and a quarter percent and so there, there's some eye-opening beers in, in england and sadly you know lagers have made just a big inroad there and um that started in yeah. the night real ale now is just um kind of a specialty it's far from commonplace anymore but you, you can still find it and uh here at alesmith and i know that you're a fan of real ale we we, we do firkins and pins yeah. all the time um and I've, I've been a camera member since 1998 every year i renew i didn't know that oh yeah i got my bar towels and t-shirts and um uh re real ale is important it should be kept alive with with camera, I believe they give you like a book. Like there's this like thick book that like distinguishes all the different bars that are camera sponsored or, or in that realm. Yeah, yeah. And and then they really recommend that book that everyone who's into real ale who wants to make them homebrew should have. It's called Sellermanship and that book it it's thin, but everything's in there that you need to make quality real ale at home. Actually, uh, borrowed that book from Anthony Chen. I think that's uh, the best part. I was studying for my advanced Cicerone, and that was one of the books they should. They're like, you need to know cast beers. And so, before we get into like cellarmanship, let's like, like just take us even a step further back. Let's talk about what cast beer. What is cast beer? I know Camera, which we've already mentioned, campaign for real ale, and cast have a 
a tight knit. And I believe it started in the seventies, if not eighties. But what is what is past beers? What are real ales? It, well, real ales are uh, where, where you're you're actually flat beer, unfinished beer into a day wooden pins and firkins, but now they use stainless steel. Um, and you're carbonating it in the firkin or the pin. And uh, that's how you get the carbonation. There's nothing artificial introduced. There's no artificial gas. And there, there was a big backlash on the, when the loggers first hit. And they were just, they, they called them gassy loggers because, you know, you, they made you burp and there was so much carbonation in it. And so the hardcore, the old school, wanted to hold out and say, hey, if you're going to call this real ale, there can't be anything in this beer but malt, hops, you know, water and yeast. And you're going to get yeah. your carbonation from the extra fermentation that's going to occur with a small amount of sugar added to the cask before you seal it up and a little bit of yeast. And Absolutely. it also affects the body. You, you get this silky smoothness and you get the smallest little bubbles in, in your head of beer. And sometimes it's even, you know, flat or flat-ish, you know. Um, a typical beer, 2.5 volumes, uh, PPM in a, in a, a volumes of CO2. One, one and a quarter is acceptable in Cascale. And um, if it's a quality beer, you, you don't really mind the big, the big gas input. And there's also a little bit more of a, of a craftsmanship when it comes to the barkeep, because the barkeep has to have them at a certain time, kind of like degassing with a soft spile, soft spile, awesome, hard time, hard spile. Now it's ready to go. Let's hook it up. Uh, and that's, that's where the classic question came in, like, where as a guest, as a pub patron, you'd walk in and say, hey, what's tasting great today? Mm -hmm. Oh, the cask of blank. Yeah. Boom. And even furthermore, when it comes to um, cask beers, the north and the south actually have a big split where the, that sparkler that you add on the end of the swan neck, because some people like the sparkler, which creates that beautiful frothy head, which makes it appealing and then you have the other side which don't like the sparkler you they want a little bit of tiny small tight compact bubbles yeah I, you, you gotta love the english you know they, they get i say this lovingly they get so uptight about change in beers and and um you know if you go to you, you go to belgium you order a beer it's it's uh you, you may get half head and half beer and that's proper and that's why they give you a big goblet and Absolutely. that's the beer you go to England, if you don't fill it to the very top of a 16 ounce cream, and that's why they have the little marks there that mark the 16 ounce. I wish you had, uh, actually, don't. are you using, are you using the 20 ounce Nonic right now, out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah. Imperial Pint right there. Love it, yeah. The, the older you get, 12 ounces doesn't seem like a beer anymore. Right? I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it be 16 or 20, yeah, there you go, or 24.5. Yeah, 25.4. That's awesome. Uh, beautiful 750 milliliter. Haven't even dived into it. Um, but yeah, the, the English have uh, just a quick little uh, introduction about history. Like we were mentioning, change is difficult for the English in general. Um, hops came from northern Germany, then made their way to uh, Belgium, Flanders, where they then migrated over to England. And within 100 years, they were using hopped beers. Um, styles evolved you're mild i'm curious did ailsmith ever make a mild in its existence we did we we nodded our uh, back at cabot we did and um matt aiken was kind of championing that and then he started brewing his at, at benchmark i was a big mild fan it's just uh commercially a little tough um not everyone's into them but to get a flavorful beer out of a four percent alcohol is, is is a challenge and um if a, a fine mild is a is a the thing of beauty and so let's get into uh let's get into a couple classic for we'll kind of like bounce around classic beer styles that you think are like the epitome of english beers um for me when it comes to mild if you find a mild i was just uh doing a nice little walk the home brewer on el cajon they made a mild a while back ago that i was like i remember it was a little bit more like november december getting a little chilly Got a crawler that brought it home, making dinner, potatoes, veggies, um, maybe it was like a chicken, chicken thigh. One of the best food and beer pairings. Nice. Yeah, George is a good brewer over there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I love Miles. I love the best. Best bitter is an overlooked style. It, it's, uh, 
It's a mi middle of the road. It, it's the beer you're going to go to first, first of the day when you're traveling in England. You're on your real ale journey. And uh, toasty, bready, malty, and then swing over to the East Kent Golding and the Styrian hops on the back end in different variety, in different, you know, uh, quantities as, as you travel different parts of England. I, I was fortunate enough that when I was in law school, I did my second year in Oxford and I, I got to actually live at uh, Magdalen College in the middle of Oxford. And I rented a bike and everything's flat there. So you can ride tens of miles in every direction and you go into these little shires. You don't even know the name of it, but it, it's a pub. So you walk in and all 16 people just turn and stare at you. You know, I was like, who the <laughs> and I would just like, you know, mind my P's and Q's, look down, go to the bar, pine of your best bitter, please. You know, be polite when you're in England. They really appreciate the pleases and thank yous. Uh, the first, <laughs> uh, I could tell you a million stories, but I have a friend, we're still friends. You know, he's in Soho. And um, we first met when I pulled on the door of the Red Lion pub and it was locked. And he, he looked through and he looked at me and he let me in. I go, why is your door locked? He said, well, there's a soccer match tonight and the, and the hooligans come and they tear my place up. So I got to let people in one at a time. <laughs> well, after he let me in, I ordered a beer and I, I said, could I have a pint of the best bitter, please? He said, you're, you're not American. I said, yeah, I am. He goes, no, you can't be American. Goes, Why you say that? He goes, because you asked for your beer saying, please. And his name's Barry. He still yeah. owns Red Lion. We're still friends. And I'm talking 38 years ago that happened. So... <laughs> I love you. Stay, please. Food. You must yeah. not be American. Yeah. That's sad. That's, That's all. Awesome. Yeah. I hope, times hopefully have changed. Times yeah. hopefully. Be polite. Say please. Say thank you to your beer tender, to your barkeep. Um, so let's quickly talk about talking about your best bitter. Let's talk about ESB. Where does that fall? And what were the visions for? Because here in San Diego, that's for the most part our best view of of the bitter family. Uh, the ESB slash. English Pale Ales, which Zonk was. I know over at Burning Beard, um, Jeff Jeff is making Banksy, and Banksy has that awesome malt complexity. It's not overly hoppy. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. What's ESB like in your vision, and where does that fall? Yeah, ESB to me is, is, is the strongest of the bitter family, and, and I think it has the most commercial viability, and I think that's why Alesmith chose it to be its flagship back in 1995. Um, you know, it, it has the hop character, it has the malt, and it has a little bit more alcohol. It can push that to five and three quarters. And so I think that had good commercial appeal. Um, it was our, you know, number one beer for many, many years. And then finally, and then IPA kind of took over, and then Speedway Stout kind of took over. And IPA, I mean, ESB, you know, started falling, and um, we still make it, but now it comes off our 10-barrel system rather than our 85-barrel. And um, I think that's a shame. I have to ask, when it comes to that small 10 barrel system, that's direct fire, right? It is, yeah. So like you get some really nice like caramelization, Maillard reaction type of flavors off of yeah. that now. I was excited that's about awesome. direct fire. Like, you know, we, we had steam over at Cabot, we have steam here. But direct fire is interesting, you gotta be careful with it. But uh, yeah, it gives you a different malt character for sure. Absolutely. So we have Best Bitter, you have your ESB. Um, differences from your perspective when you guys made ESB, so Classic Ooh. Alesmith ES, Anvil ESB, versus Zonked over at uh, McKellar. Because I recently had that, and that had a little bit more hop character, in my opinion. Yeah. And, uh, the grain was a little bit, like, subdued. It wasn't as, how do I say, as rich, if you will. Yeah. No, that's very perceptive, Chris. I, um, I agree on all points there. Um, they wanted to, you know, Dan over there, we, we, we talked this through over a couple of weeks uh, and we talked about making a beer that was like a modern interpretation of an old style beer. So I didn't want, first of all, I didn't want to give them the ESB recipe. <laughs> for uh, so Unless we, yeah. you're tuning into this IG Live, Peter Zion is going <laughs> to give you the ESB recipe. Well, I'm still not keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dan... <laughs> Dan's really creative over there. I'm a big fan of the McKellar San Diego beers. I think they make fantastic stuff. So he uh, convinced me that there was a couple specialty malts I'd never used before that he wanted to use. Um, totally different malt character than the Alesmith one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I first tried it, I was like, okay, you know, it's nice, but it, it's been growing on me. And especially with a month of age on it now, I think the malt's getting a little bit richer. They yes. used some uh, no noble hops, but of the newer varieties that they have, um, they have connections to Styrian and East Kent. They're triploid um, experimentals. <clears throat> they give you the noble, you, you get the earthiness out of them, uh, but it's definitely different. I mean, Alesmith ESB in its heyday, um, you know, we're always trying to search for that holy grail. And uh, with all beer making, replicating isn't always easy. And, and there's so many nuances, hundreds and hundreds of parameters coming down right to the baromatic pressure of the day you brew on, you know, and how the yeast will perform. And so I, I think of the ESBs we made circa 2004 to 2008, um, really, really the Todd and I fighting over how much hop character should be on the back end or not. I was always a big fan of like being able to smell the beer from 12 inches, like when it's a foot away and you get a yeah. whiff of hop and Todd said, that's too much. So we, in a weird way that, that fighting that we did on, you know, fighting the guy's my brother practically. Basically, um, honestly, <laughs> it's, it's cool beers because we really had to plead our case, you know? And so the, the, those ESBs and then, so, then we got the 30 barrel system over there and we lost that boil kettle that was um it was a soup it was made for soups the original alesmith boil kettle it was a soup kitchen kettle that was bought at surplus and it had three chambers of heat on it and you could preheat the bottom chamber and when you first start doing your runoff from your lauder ton mm -hmm. you could it snap and caramel as it as it crawled over the stainless steel floor oh and, yeah and you know we I've never seen that since. And, and we, we've tried to replicate in um, heating and in recipe changes to reach that. And it's just nuances that you just keep striving for. Um, Ryan and Anthony have done a great job getting real close to it. So I, I'm pleased with the ESB now. But it was probably the hardest beer to dial into the new Crone system when we moved from Cabot. Um, Absolutely. ESB was the hardest. I can imagine the small nuances is kind of like in the weird sense, like almost like a decoction, like that, how that plays and the different methods, oh. getting that caramelization just right when it hits that hot surface, it's almost, it's, it's almost so difficult to recreate. Yeah. Um, the aroma was amazing. It was out of, out of curiosity. Oh. I wanted to ask you this, uh, don't have the box anymore. So Samuel Smith, we were talking about this. Uh, again, this is Peter Zion of Alesmith Brewing Company and Cheese Smith. Um, we were talking about how you, you, I think you said this during, this is maybe national homebrew competition that we were judging. And you were saying, I, I really wanted to get open fermentation for my, or like Yorkshire squares for the small system. I still can't find to this day the benefits of this open fermentation. Can you like somewhat explain open fermentation when it comes to not spontaneous sours, which I love, but English beers. Like how does, what's that? Well, you know, the, the, the true nod is just to tradition. You know, um, you're asking me to give you science, why it makes a better beer. I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Um, I just, um, early Alesmith was open fermentation. We had horizontal dairy tanks and- we, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, we had horizontal- no tanks we would fill them we put the yeast in um the osmotic pressure on the yeast cells was very low and it created a different fermentation and that's as much science as i can give you uh, of why i think yorkshire squares um the conical tanks that most breweries all breweries have now are, are big vertical tanks that mm -hmm. there's a lot of weight going on in there you got you know eight pounds per gallon of liquid on top of and you know we have 240 mm -hmm. fermenters uh, squeezing these yeast cells, forcing them to act differently than, yeah. than they don't have that pressure. So um, I remember, you know, the ESB is coming out of that open fermentation, but it, it was a big headache, you know, crossing levels would change all the time. And we, we weren't even counting our yeast. We, we would just, you know, from a prior batch, throw a sanitized bucket of yeast back into the next one. And the next morning I'd open the door over at the old brewery and I knew when there was an overflow, I just, when I opened the door, I would just take one whiff. And when it smelled like a bakery and cookies, yeah. I knew it was going to be beer and yeast all over the floor. And we would- Sounds have, delightful though. 
it was the first few times, but then, you know, it requires over an hour and a half of cleanup. The, yeah. the lids, the stainless steel lids that take two people to put on because they're so heavy, the yeast and the crossing had no problem depositing them on the ground. Yeah. That, that's the kind of pressure we're talking about. And so, you know, eventually I gave in. I said, okay, let's just get rid of these dairy tanks and let, let, let's get control over the situation. But, you know, in anything, cheese making, beer making, baking, bread, whatever you do, nods to tradition, I always feel give you a different and better product because the commercialized product that we get out in the world right now, they're just trying to get things done fast and make money, you know, for the most part. Uh, right. You know, of course, there's the exceptions, but um, I want to be making things the longest and the slowest it takes. Um, thinking about every single bit of it, you know, um, don't be in such a rush. And I think that's why when the open fermentation, I mean, I did dream of that and I'm not done dreaming. I may still get some open fermenters in here. Uh, we I mean, have that'd be super amazing. Room to do it, but yeah. So uh, again, ju just tradition. If, you, if you're in San Francisco and you tour Anchor Steam, um, yeah. You can walk down there and look through and see the giant swimming pools where they're still doing open fermentation and, and top crossing and harvesting their yeast in that method. As well as, um, I don't know if they still do it, Firestone Walker with a DBA series, um, where I think they have, it's called a like uh, union, uh, ah, come on, Chris, where union. like the crossing drops into the next barrel. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Yep. For a union system uh, or something of that manner. Burton Union, yep. Um, that would be phenomenal to get into. Uh, before we jump into uh, this old ale, one big thing, so from, uh, and you're a beer judge, grandmaster, level two? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. It's no big deal. <laughs> More like a DJ. <laughs> Second edition. Um, can you please tell me, when it comes to Scottish beers, when it comes to Scottish beers, what is the biggest difference from English beers? I get the Irish with the Irish red and the dry Irish stout, but for the most part, the Bell Havens, the Scottish, the Scottish just have, I, I don't, I never really picked up what the different nuances are about them. You know, it, it's, it's very subtle and you're not alone. Um, when you're studying for these exams, whether Cicerone or BJCP, if you look at the brewing parameters and you hold the English beers next to the Scottish, they line up almost identically. And so it's kind of a cheat that I can give you right now. It's just memorize the original gravities and, and make the connections and you'll see. Um, I like to think of the Irish beers as actually even maltier, you know, is, is the only thing I can really put my finger on. Uh, a density in color, they're usually given a little bit more on the SRMs across the board. Mm -hmm. And um, they have their own yeast strains too, which are propriety, propriety to the, that part of the country. So, but, but they're very similar. And, you know, America is a big country. Europe is not. Scotland and England are, are 80 miles apart. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're connected. And then, so, you know, there's a lot of similarities in these styles. Um, I, I never really, you know, I don't know. I, I drink Guinness at times, uh, um, uh, but I don't really drink. I, I prefer the English varieties almost across the board. Absolutely, like London Porter. There's uh, there's so many amazing English varieties, um, and also thank you so much for making a wee heavy. I think wee heavy in this grand scheme of super hoppy San Diego beers, or maybe even pale beers, um, Belgian beers. We, I mean, of course, we're talking about English beers, but like even Belgian beers. Belgian beers never really had their own jump here in San Diego. Um, wee heavy, honestly, wee heavy is like. Just looking at this chapter, Scottish, I like the Scottish lights, I love the, the exports, but we have these, have some body to them, have some texture, uh, a little bit of that deep toffee notes in there. Yeah, there isn't a lot of styles of, like a good we heavy. It's your true in front of the fireplace beer. And uh, th thank you, Randy, for putting Alesmith as one of the examples under the we heavy. Darn it, you took my point. I was sorry. Uh, I was, Totally going to compliment you on that one. Yeah. Um, quick shout out. I actually um, underlined it. Uh, you can't see it, but I underlined Alesmith Wee Heavy right there. Uh, huge, complex, small mix of toffee and soft roastness. A little less, but sometimes a hint of peat. 
um, which shouldn't be too PD. I mean, I think that's just like finesse at that moment. But um, yeah, uh, brown ales. He then jumps into the Northern Brown, the London Brown, Nut Brown. What's the vision of Nut Brown out of curiosity before we jump into this old ale that's been staring at me this entire time? Yeah, I mean, a great Nut Brown's fantastic too. We have a pretty complex malt bill in ours and um, it just gets these little, ours is, you know, it, it's hard to call it English. It really is. I think um, what people enjoy about our Nut Brown is the cocoa chocolatey character that we get from just the specialty malts. There's no chocolate in it. Um, that beer is a quick turnaround beer. Not, you know, there's no dry hopping in that. It, it's malt forward, easy to yes. drink. It was um, originally brewed just to show people that a dark beer doesn't have to be big and heavy. So the first one Todd and I brewed together was 4.9. And it was maybe as dark as a brown porter and not so much as a nut brown. Mm -hmm. Competitively, it doesn't do that well because it, it always gets dinged for the color, but I really don't want to change it. And, you know, I'd rather brew a beer people like than to have a little metal or some judge thinking it's to style. So, um, but it, when we do enter it, we do enter it as a Northern Brown. And that's uh, just kind of, I think mostly because it's got that toasty nutty character and, and a little bit of the caramel. And um, you can go a little heavy handier on the su Southern because they grow all the hops down there in the South in England. Absolutely. And, if you can remind me, there's a big difference between the North and the South, and there's a sweetness factor. I'm trying to remember if it's, I don't think it's the North that's a little bit on the sweeter side, or is it the South? I think, I think the it's London. Because the, the hops are going to temper your, your, your sweetness, I think. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to find good examples of these low-alcohol English beers here in the U.S. that travel well. Um, you really got to well, when all this is over and you can travel again, you know, go to England and just do nothing but go to pubs and different towns and try their beers. I mean, um, and then go, go to a museum or two so your wife doesn't get mad. But um, it, it's such a great beer country. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see uh, someone uh, nuttiness uh, also will uh, will always be nautical and nut brown for locals. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Nut brown was called nautical and nut yeah. brown. Yeah, we ended up trying to get our, you know, we figured there's another well-known brewery in town that's got all the nautical themes. We figured, go ahead, take it. You could have that one, right? Yeah. Right. Um, let's get into, so I've been enjoying this amazing ESB out of this, uh, actually, vintage. Oh, wow, the gold one. Yeah, nice. The gold one. Um, Don't put it in the dishwasher. No, these are, these are hand clean. Um, yeah. But I have to say... Barley wines, old ales. Old ale is my top five styles. Um, it's really one of the things that pulled me into Alesmith and then like kind of like locked the key, locked the, locked the door and like threw the key away. Um, the complexity in old ales truly is magnifying. Um, we have 2014 old ale. Ooh, I know we kind of touched on it, but let's get into what you're judging. Barley wine versus old ales. They're very subtle. Uh, nuances back in the day, pertaining to the book, used to be called Stock Ale. Mm -hmm. That's where they would age it after October, let it sit, and maybe some Pretenomyces, some British fungus would start to come arise, and they would blend it back in with uh, some fresh beer. But Old Ale, barley wine, what's the biggest difference? Yeah, again, you know, very subtle. Uh -huh. Case of American barley wines, there's always gonna the hop character is always gonna be the big difference, but the complexities and the melanoidins and the malt character of a of a well made old ale. Excuse me, I'm allowed to burp on a beer show, right? Okay. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> this is just my Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> You're totally so, fine. <laughs> you want a combination of uh, you know invert and non invert sugars. Um, I don't have to list them, but there's a wide range of different things that could be added directly to the kettle. And I think that sets a barley wine and a old ale apart. The barley wine, the malt bill is going to, you know, is gonna, that's how you'll get your gravity. Your gravity points will be all from your malt bill, whereas the old ale, there's going to be kettle additions. And, and that's the family of invert and non-invert sugars um, that you can find and get creative with. You know, as a home brewer, 
some people get into home brewing to save money and that's just laughable because you end up spending like a ton of money and each beer end up costing you like you know nine hundred dollars after you bought your big system and all that stuff oh but, yeah the, the mr beer kit only goes so far and then you're like it, and then you, you get that itch you get the home brewing itch that you've always talked about right so um you know i was of the i i wanted to do something different i have a law degree i didn't want to be an attorney and then i found this unbelievable you know, hobby called brewing uh, that was a blend of art and science that I just couldn't believe. And you can be creative and you can feel like you're doing something no one else has done. You, you can put on a scientist hat and figure out all your formulas and do that. You can be an artist, draw your own labels. It, it's so encompassing. I see why so many people are drawn to beer. But for me in home brewing, I was mail ordering product from all over and it gave me a big advantage to the locals that I was competing against in the competitions that were just going to the local store and buying whatever they recommended. But I was doing my research and, and I could order from a, a home brew shop in Salt Lake City that had uh, franco Belgis Malteris, you know, malts from France that you couldn't get in San Diego. And then I would mail order sugars and syrups and all sorts of stuff to, to, to get gravity points from. And yeah. it was in that experimentation that, you know, a month and a half later, you've bottled it and it's conditioned and it's ready to try. Nothing like that premiere night when you're a home brewer. You waited, a, you've waited six weeks and you have your glass cleaned, you have your coaster out, you have the beer there, you're replaying memories of brew day. Yeah, you know, it's just wonderful. And then you crack and it. Yeah, it's just fantastic. The, the crack and that hiss, and you're like, yeah. thank you know, it God. Of, and then you quickly <laughs> hold your breath and you hope it doesn't foam over and you're like, Okay, okay, good. We're set. Ah, I hate to get all, you know, nerdy about this, but it, it's so much fun. And it so is. it set me on a career, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for it. And it, it still feels fresh, you know. Um, it's a little bit bigger scale now, and I'm sitting on sensory panels and all that and tasting our beers that I'll, I only had recipe formulation to do with, and I don't get the fun. I, I walk into the brew house. They all get quiet now. I'm that guy. Like, come on. No tell way, dude. Tell, tell that joke. Don't worry about me. I, you, know, you hate being an owner sometimes. But anyway, uh, what got me into beer is still alive in my heart. And um, talking about it like this just brings back such great memories. I know. It's crazy that we're, we're even bringing it back to home brewing. The small nuances that really made and captivated our hearts. And it's just those, it, for, I, I kind of like to encompass everything we've been talking about. It's the the slow slow like process and really enjoying the small moments where home brewing six weeks bottle conditioning it sucks it takes a while you hope it works you hope you put enough sugar and you hope the actual bot it actually bottle condition but um before we uh and also this old ale is phenomenal it's super complex i still dream of i think it was 2010 decadence barrel age <laughs> that's like still we got I some think, we got some 05 still i have i have most of them but uh i opened bottle number one barrel aged on my wedding uh wed wedding day but uh yeah the, it still hasn't cleared up it's still cloudy you know 15 yeah. years later it's amazing that's crazy that's yeah. right but, yeah, um fine to lay down for 20 years and and that's what the the old ale and especially when it's uh, when I was working over at Pure, uh, at Alesmith, where we won private stock for like an older version of it, um, because they said it doesn't have that age component yet. Can you yeah. really, like talk a little bit about the age component that we're kind of looking for with this type of style, which in San Diego is kind of hard. It really is hard to find. Yeah, well, you know, you want to leave them fat, and by fat I mean high final gravities. You want you want sugars remaining. You want food in there for the the microbacteria and the yeast cells that do remain to do their thing. So when you drink a fresh old ale, sometimes they do seem um, not cloying, but maybe a little too sweet. Um, On the verge, if you will. Yeah, we would load ours up with a pretty good hop character because I really wanted it to reach its peak in, in the five to 10 year range. So mm -hmm. year one, it might seem hoppy. Um, but yeah, that, that beer for us, uh, old ale, and private stock, it's uh, modern iteration have 
um, have won more medals for us at the GIBF than any other beer we've made. We have six total um, on that and, and a World Beer Cup as well. So I'm just grateful every time, um, every time that category comes up right at the end and we've entered, I'm sitting there with my heart just going, boom, 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 and then they go. And her, and the goal goes to and like bleep, 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 bleep. I totally remember that. I just I yeah. totally forgot. Um, we were at the Great American Beer Festival, literally, which feels like decades ago, last October. Yeah. And uh, L. Smith won for private yeah. stock. Right. I was so happy. You know, I'm happy for my team. And if we don't win, you know, it's not a you know, it can't be your turn every time. So I'm always happy whoever whoever does win. I I, I selfishly do want it to be a San Diego brewery. But if it can't, uh, but yeah, that, that was silly. I was sitting on my couch and I watched the live feed because I send a different team every year to GABF. So mm -hmm. feel that thrill. And uh, yeah, I, I was proud of the team that day. It's a great thrill. And uh, we're going to quickly talk about stouts, but I just want to say that Falling Rock has taken all my money as far as I'm concerned. Like, <laughs> you go to the Great American Beer Festival, you end up at Falling Rock and you're just there for... <laughs> So cool. Way longer than you should. Yeah. God, it's so crowded. If you can go go downstairs, it's uh, better. Oh, it's way awesome. Um, stouts. Um, let's just quickly talk about stouts before um, before we wrap up. Stouts. We have the milk stout. We have the sweet stout. The oatmeal stout. The dry Irish stout. The foreign export stout. The imperial stout. How has the stout evolved in your eyes? And are there any? true to style stouts that you'd recommend people going out here in San Diego, if possible, that they should go definitely go look for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know, I know it's quarantine time. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm, I love our speedway, but it, it, it's a big Imperial stout at 12.5% and has coffee in it. So traditional English, perhaps not. Um, but, yeah, um, it's interesting. Stout, stout is the product of really uh, water chemistry and that it evolved out of the part of the world where the water was really high in carbonate, bicarbonate value. And um, the stout employs roasted barley, which has an acidifying effect on pH. Yep. And uh, yeah, the alkaline uh, carbonate, bicarbonate bond would be broken. So they were making all sorts of you know, beers in Ireland, but when they made a stout, it seemed more balanced and drinkable. And um, so San Diego water is high in carbonate, bicarbonate. And if you're not treating your water, you're probably making better beers than you are light beers. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, I, it's hard to uh, pick out some of the stouts. Um, you know, the Beer Geek over at Mick Heller is a really uh, delicious beer, but it's got a really high final gravity is higher than most people's starting gravity in their base beers. So um, it, some people find it sweet, but I love their vanilla shea. I love our, um, our, our um, Speedway, you know, the different, it, it's a wonderful back palate for trying all different kinds of coffee. And it isn't perhaps as roasty, and that might be a secret to its success. Um, mm -hmm. Roasted barley can be really acrid, and so not, not everyone's cup of tea. I'm a Guinness fan. I know everyone isn't, um, but... Um, a, a proper Guinness poured correctly in good shape and, and a proper age is a delicious thing. And there isn't really any other beer like it with that sour component. And to, met, and to talk about Guinness, Guinness does still to this day, with, as far as this book and what I've been reading, Guinness still blends in some of their stale with their fresh. Right. Like we were talking about tradition earlier during this uh, IG Live. That's tradition to its pure core like yeah, you it. don't need to do that but yeah you still do and i'm highly respectful for guinness for still doing that yeah i love i love things like that I, um some sometimes in the beer world especially counter intuition is a valuable thing and if you think you know everything or you think it should be this because you heard it somewhere just just i would just ask you to think on your own be your own artist and come up with ideas and who knows, you know, the next great beer in the world could, could be yours, you know. So um, I love the picture on page 164 of those ceramic bottles. I actually own three of them. Uh, really? A gentleman gave me three bottles that he got at an auction. They're, they're the way beer bottles looked, you know, in the 18th century. And uh, I, have, I have three of them. I, think, I want to display them here at the brewery, I think. But ima imagine going and 
having a little cork stuck in here and that's how they bottle your beer. I'm just saying, Peter, if you make it, uh, we have a couple of people still, we have a couple of people viewing. You make it, we're most likely gonna buy it. So uh, yeah, nice. I think it'd be super rad. Uh, small system, kind of bring it back. I uh, Now that for the most part we're done with that chapter, um, there's been this crazy push for traditional, like more than I've ever seen before where, and that's the thing, when it comes to classic styles, they're gonna come back. Um, I agree. One of my favorite breweries in Southern California, Homage, which I believe you guys did a collaboration with them yep. maybe two months ago. They just released a black lager, a Schwarz beer. And I was sitting there, I was like, that's interesting. And I think Monkish, which is the most like, kind of sought after craft brewery niche, uh, hazy IPA maker, they made a, a Schwarz beer. And I sat there in the same month and I was like, okay, maybe well, you have to be that brewery where you can balance the new, yeah, you can still retell the old, the old, the classic. Well, that, that's what we're striving to do, Dale Smith. We're, you know, in our 25th year, so you can't help but people look at you as the classic brewery, but innovation is really important too. And you want to be in touch with the new drinker and what they want. So, you know, we're, we have a foot in each game. You know, I, I really want to be a traditionalist. Um, my fridge at home is filled with German beers and, and European beers. And if you read the label, it says since 1540 on some of them. I mean, there's a reason those beers are still around because they're good. You know, a great, exactly. great Doppelbach. Um, and so, yes, let, bring, bring on the hazies. Bring on whatever 2021 has for us in the beer world. Go for it. I love it. The innovation. I mean, see what Omnipoyo is doing with their with the crazy outs. You can't yeah. keep up with those guys, trust me. Yeah, that last one I saw was a, it's, it's shaped like a beer, but it's a chocolate cake in there. It's actually a chocolate cake. You cut it and eat it while you drink the beer that looks exactly the same. And so anyway, I'm, I'm, I just like, <laughs> love innovation, but let's not give up tradition. Tradition is, is grand and, and we need to it keep really it is. alive. And, and as long as I'm at the helm of Alesmith, I'm, I'm going to keep it alive here. But, uh, I also want the new drinker and tell me what you like. And if I like it, we're going to make it. I know hazies were very, you know, created a, kind of a war. But, you know, when I started warming up to the to the well-made ones, I fell in love with it. I've always been a fan of non-bitter hoppy beers. So going yeah. back to Evil Dead Reds and, you know, back in the day. So um, let's let's before we jump, uh, there's like two things I want to say. Um, first one. You guys had this Italian grape ale that was show stomping. And I was like, these guys are pushing the boundaries. And then for some odd reason, I decided to look through my BJCP 2015 guidelines. And it's right there in the back. It's an actual style. Um, I thought that was innovative because you're exposing people to a, a style that's there, but they don't just don't see it. So it becomes something new and refreshing. Um, I thought that one deserved a little bit more highlight. And I still think it does. Um, if you guys still have it. Um, but yeah. one more thing I wanted to mention was, darn it, I totally forget now. <laughs> Two things. Um, I love finding the obscure styles. You know, as a home brewer, I would search and read. And if I could read a book from the 1920s or the 1880s, and you start reading in there and you find something, and, and, and it's, it's like getting your, your foot in the door, and you're like, I'm bringing this back. And I remember brewing a Gotlandrika, which is a, it, it has juniper berries that are made for gin, but there's actually mm -hmm. a style that can be made with that. And anyone brave enough to make a cock ale with, with a whole chicken in it, um, maybe don't want to try that. But George Washington ha has a recipe out there if you want to, you want to give that a And try. if you want to like heat up some rocks and toss it in to heat up your uh, mash, by all means, I've heard it done once at, in San Diego. It could probably be done again. We did it, uh, yeah, back in the late. <laughs> 90s with the Blarney stoned beer and Blarney stones, yeah. small pieces of the rock chips are still in the back over in the now McKellar brewery over on Cabot. You can see that's what gives it the flavor, the unique yeah. flavor. All right. Um, I think this is a great, great time to, uh, if, uh, and uh, I'm just giving a quick wrap up. Um, when it comes to British beers, British beers are all encompassing a tradition that is slow to evolve, still evolves, but with time, 
Um, it took almost 100 years for the British to really accept hops. Um, and then from there, with the pale mall, the expansion, and basically England in itself being the empire that never slept, where they colonized almost everything from the United States to India. They just moved and moved. Um, honestly, still pretty remarkable that they did all that. But we have ESB to thank for. We have Old Ales. Uh, we have these and some of the best styles because it's tradition and it's innovation at the same breath. Um, so definitely for homebrewers who are tuning in, look back at those recipes, um, recreate some of those classic ones. And at the same time, don't be afraid to push forward. Awesome. Peter, any other things you want to say before uh, we both cheers to an ESB in our hand? I, I had a great time and thank you, Chris, for all you do. You know, you've always been a big uh, proponent of beer and and education of it and i've watched you. You, uh, i've watched your career grow and i'm uh, proud of you thanks for having me today oh peter zion uh <laughs> again thank you so much peter you're the best cheers cheers bud cheers bro